Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We gather here during truly extraordinary times. The last five years have been bar marked by historically high levels of volatility in international energy markets. The world is still emerging from the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Many economies are struggling to recover from a severe economic downturn. And major energy consuming countries, including the United States, are discussing approaches to global climate change that could decisively shape future demand for oil and gas. The Baker Institute Energy Forum's research agenda reflects these uh, developments. Over the last three years, we have focused on how the United States energy and climate policy may impact U.S. energy pricing. Uh, North American national, natural gas markets and global energy markets. This morning, we will be presenting our findings on a wide uh, range of uh, scenarios for U.S. shale gas, renewable energy, electric cars, and carbon pricing uh, in the United States. Uh, today's discussions will be broad, as you can see from your program, ranging from prospects for oil and gas development in the United States and Nigeria to the role of new technologies and public <coughs> transportation in shaping future energy markets. Uh, we are truly delighted that top industry leaders and top experts are here with us today uh, to share their views on these and other important uh, topics. Now, our research on U.S. climate change policy attempts to capture the often bewildering array of proposals uh, currently under uh, discussion in the Congress and elsewhere. Uh, the purpose of our endeavor is to raise the level of debate on this timely and important policy subject. Right now, we believe that the United States would benefit from greater, more detailed, and I want to stress non-polemic, discussion on the options to address energy and climate challenges. For example, extensive polling in the United States shows that a plurality of Americans has never even heard of carbon abatement cap and trade systems. According to a February 2010 poll by the Pew Center uh, for the People and the Press, only 17% of Americans said they heard a lot about cap and trade policy compared with 46% who said they simply have heard nothing about it. So there is a problem in terms of public education. Now we want to thank ConocoPhillips, the Institute for Energy e Economics of Japan, Horizon Wind, and the Baker Institute Energy Forum for their generous support of this research, which has allowed us to create comprehensive analytic tools to model the effect of U.S. policy on our future use of hydrocarbons and alternative energies. And given the importance of the United States and global consumption of energy, the impact of U.S. climate change policy on global natural gas and especially oil markets could obviously be substantial. Our preliminary findings reveal some dramatic observations about policies under debate in the United States. Development of massive shale gas resources in the United States will greatly enhance our national security by reducing the need for imported LNG and limiting the petrol power of states such as Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. According to our studies, a national renewable energy standard, though very appealing, would not actually reduce U.S. foreign oil imports, while at the same time would only lessen U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 4% by the year 2050. By contrast, an aggressive policy promoting electrified vehicles could cut greenhouse gas emissions by twice that amount by 2050, while at the same time still eliminating 2.5 million barrels a day of oil demand beyond the already substantial 3 million barrels a day savings expected to come from tighter corporate average fuel efficiency standards for United States automobiles. A 50 percent cap on U.S. carbon emissions by 2050 would be certainly advantageous for a United States commitment to a global climate change regime, but could result, but could result in a tripling of U.S. <coughs> electricity prices 
depending on how the cap would be implemented. So you could see the complexity of the implementation of such policies. We look forward to sharing the details of our research results with you over the next two days and debating the path forward to a sound and cost-effective U.S. energy and climate policy. We are deeply honored to have a major gathering of important energy leaders and analysts to discuss this timely subject with your input. And we are very pleased and honored to welcome today Her Excellency the Azani Allison Mandueke, President of Petroleum Resources of Nigeria. The Minister's ambitious reform agenda for Nigeria's oil sector and her much anticipated leadership at OPEC have recently received extensive media coverage both in the United States and, of course, in Nigeria. We would also like to acknowledge our many prominent guests, including engineer Austin Oniwan, the <clears throat> Group Managing Director, Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, our very good friend Jim Mulva, Chairman and CEO of ConocoPhillips. I also have the pleasure of welcoming Mr. Masakazu Toyoda, the Chairman and CEO of the Institute for Energy Economics of Japan, and Hamad al Khattar and Fahad al Tamimi from Qatar uh, Petroleum. There are many others uh, who are in the audience uh, who we would like to acknowledge, but the list is long. In conclusion, I would like to express our appreciation to those whose support has made this conference possible, ConocoPhillips and Baker Botts LLP. We thank them for their generous underwriting of this event. So it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. As Nigeria's Minister of Petroleum Resources, she holds a position of great responsibility within both her own country and in global energy markets. I had the pleasure of having dinner with the minister last night, and she is one of the most charming, intelligent, and I think very effective leaders that I have met. Uh, Her Excellency has set the bar high for herself, taking on the challenge of driving new and important reforms in Nigeria's energy sector. She is committed to see Nigeria take its important place in the global natural gas market and to ensuring that Nigeria continues its role as a top energy exporter to the United States. Nigeria will be an increasingly important energy supplier to the United States and an energetic partner to the United States in regional African diplomacy and global deliberations. It is therefore fitting that Minister Alison Madueke opens our conference on U.S. energy and climate policy. Our speaker is uniquely qualified to address the issues facing Nigeria's energy sector and its role in global markets. She has had a long and distinguished career within the energy sector. She began her career in the Nigerian oil sector in 1992 at Shell Petroleum Development Company. She served in several capacities and eventually was named the first female member of the board of directors of Shell Nigeria. Our speaker was appointed Federal Minister of Transportation in 2007 and then Federal Minister of Mines and Steel Development in 2008. President Goodluck Jonathan appointed her as Federal Minister of Petroleum Resources on April 6, 2010, in which capacity she will hold the distinction of being the first woman minister within OPEC. I, we were joking about the minister has already signaled to OPEC that she's going to be asking for increased quotas for Nigeria, and so uh, I wish I could be at the OPEC meeting just to see the body language at that meeting. <laughs> First woman minister in OPEC, that's going to be rather remarkable. Uh, with Minister Alison Madueke at the helm, Nigeria is well positioned to become an even more important partner for the United States, so we're truly privileged to have Her Excellency with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, Without further ado, it's my honor to introduce the Minister of Petroleum Resources of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Her Excellency Diazana Alison Madueke, Your Excellency. Ambassador Georgian, 
members of the faculty of the Baker Institute for Public Policy, chieftains of the oil and gas industry who are with us here today, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by wishing you all a very good morning. And I must say, I love the weather here. I'm told I brought the good weather to you in Houston, and I'm very glad for that. Let me, of course, start by thanking the Institute for inviting me to deliver this keynote address to such a distinguished gathering of industry captains and experts. Recent events, such as the unprecedented heat wave in Russia, the flooding in Pakistan, and, of course, the oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, all point to a rapidly evolving climatic and environmental trend. In Nigeria this year, we have also witnessed changing seasonal patterns, which are quite unusual, such as delayed rains, uh, flooding in the south, and very unusual cloudy haze. A number of these trends cannot be divorced from global warming, for which the operations or products of our oil and gas industry have been held partly responsible, as you all know. In Nigeria, our over 50 years of experience in the oil and gas industry continue to reveal the complex dynamics of balancing global energy security with domestic economic growth, climate, and environmental considerations as well. As such, we have realized the importance of a holistic approach to policy formulation and we are making significant efforts in this regard. Therefore, I think there cannot be a better time than now to re-strategize on sustainable policies for the sector. I therefore consider this event a very important one and a personal privilege for me to be invited uh, to deliver this keynote address. In particular, I appreciate the opportunity to share Nigeria's experience as well as our goals and policy efforts with this distinguished audience. Various scenarios of future global energy demand point to increased consumption over the next 20 years. The International Energy Agency forecasts that global demand will grow from 12,000 million tons of oil equivalent in 2007 to 16,800 million tons of oil equivalent by the year 2030, which is an average annual growth of about 1.5%. Although non-fossil fuel sources are expected to grow in relative proportion, fossil fuels will continue to dominate the mix, with natural gas growing in importance, obviously relative to the others, in view of its relatively greener credentials. It is important, therefore, to note that a significant part of future supply of oil and gas will come from even fewer countries, wherein over 57% of global reserves are now concentrated. Equally important is the fact that a major part of the growth in global energy demand will also come from fewer countries, notably rapidly developing economies such as China and India. Nigeria is one of the very few countries that actually has a significant resource base to contribute to the growing world demand. It also has a growing domestic demand inherent in it that also contributes to this concentrated uh, world growth in demand. Specifically at this time, Nigeria the country has 37 billion barrels of crude oil reserves and a production capacity of over 3 million barrels per day. Within OPEC, Nigeria is ranked the sixth largest supplier of crude oil. Similarly, our proven gas reserves at this time stand at 187 trillion cubic feet, with about 600 trillion cubic feet additional in undiscovered gas potential. Nigeria is currently the world's seventh largest in terms of proven gas reserves. But with the estimated undiscovered potential, it could easily be within the world's top three in gas reserves. And this resource base underpins a thriving sector of oil and gas activity uh, within the country. As global energy demand increases, inevitably, oil and gas sector activities will grow at an unprecedented pace in Nigeria. The environmental and climatic impact of such increased activity arising from both the need to increase export supply as well as to meet growth in domestic consumption will make Nigeria a perfect test case 
for both climate and environmental policy development and assessment. Let me now go ahead to share with you some of our national environmental and economic aspirations in this regard. As you all know, Nigeria is a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol. In line with this, we have recently developed a draft policy to address climate change in Nigeria. Our draft policy at this time focuses on the, on the following, adaptation, mitigation, finance, and technology. Our aspiration, of course, is to make Nigeria, Nigeria carbon neutral by 2025, at the very latest. In essence, by that time, our mitigation strategies would have more than compensated for our emissions. Within the oil and gas industry, we are leveraging the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, to access funds for major projects. For example, at this time, two projects have so far benefited from this mechanism, and these include the AJIP Okpai Combined Cycle Power Plant and the Pan Ocean Gas Power Plant, both two very critical projects within the country. Our aspiration within the context of climate change, outlined above, falls within a wider economic parameter. Nigeria is currently aggressively pursuing its agenda to be one of the world's top economies or top 20 economies by the year 2020. To do this, we'll call for an aggressive growth in our GDP over the next few years. The energy consumption that will be associated with such growth cannot be overemphasized. To achieve and sustain the GDP growth aspirations, we are at this time on course to grow our crude oil reserves to and also maintain them at approximately 40 billion barrels through the period to 2020. To reposition the natural gas sector to support a greener, flare-free basis for aggressive economic growth. To drive more effective linkages between the industry and the GDP through increased local content and participation. And to reform critical institutions in order to entrench transparency and accountability in the energy sector. Clearly, these aspirations are rather aggressive and have to be realized in the context of complex sets of dynamics. I'd like to illustrate the complexity of the industry by taking you through the Nigerian Niger Delta, which is a source of most of Nigeria's oil and gas reserves. In the past, the Niger Delta, where I myself come from, has been referred to as the oil rivers. And this is not because of its crude oil uh, production or statistics, but because it was also a major producer of palm oil. It comprises, as I'm sure you can see on the screen behind me, the second largest swamp forest on the continent after the Congo. And it extends over 70,000 square kilometers, taking up 7.5% of the nation's land mass. The region's main historical economic activities include fisheries, agriculture, animal husbandry, textile industries, uh, to mention but a few. And essentially, it had the makings of a thriving economic framework, an entrenched social structure, and a balanced socio-economic system. However, with the advent and discovery of oil and gas in the region, there has been a major shift in that equilibrium. Amongst other things, the growth in crude oil production has translated into an unprecedented growth in associated gas production. With low domestic industrial capacity and a relatively weak gas evacuation infrastructure, produced gas is at this time underutilized, resulting in the flaring of about 1.5 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. Gas flares represent Nigeria's largest contribution to greenhouse gases. Whilst an accurate assessment of the quantum of carbon dioxide emissions in Nigeria is actually unknown, estimates of Nigeria's CO2 emissions by the Energy Intelligence Agency suggest that gas flares alone contribute about 35 million tons per annum of the world uh, CO2 emissions. Other sources of carbon dioxide in Nigeria, of course, include petroleum products and coal. Gas flares also impact on the producing communities, as we all know, as a result of which many of them probably haven't actually seen true nightfall in many, many years, but have over time 
unfortunately come to accept the flares as a part of their everyday life. In addition to these flares, environmental degradation arising from crude oil spills has been quite significant over time, resulting in a major strain on the ecosystem. And there again, you can see the unfortunate pictures behind me. Numerous oil spills have been recorded over time, and the traditional fishing industry of the region has been severely challenged by these spills. The spills are caused by both oil company operations, but also by criminal activity amongst unemployed and restive youths in the region. It is essential to note that the region has a very high youth population, and the disconnect between the industry activity and the wider economic activity of the region has resulted in a very high incidence of uh, unemployment, both within the Niger Delta region and the country as a whole. Although about $20 billion is expended by the industry annually in Nigeria, less than $5 billion of that spend is actually domiciled within the country. The consequence of this is relatively low capacity development and close to zero effective economic participation by the region in the oil and gas sector. This is clearly manifested in the high case of unemployment locally and the increased restiveness of the youths. In the extreme, we have seen this frustration degenerate into militancy in the Niger Delta. And of course, uh, that is the much talked about Niger Delta crisis of the last few years. You can therefore see that climatic and environmental issues from our oil and gas industry are interwoven with broader issues, such as the need to grow supply for global energy security, the economic empowerment and gainful employment of our people, increased industrialization and utilization outlets for natural gas. Realizing this complex interdependency, the Nigerian government has made great progress in addressing these issues through a whole gamut of policy interventions, ranging through the Niger Delta Amnesty Initiatives, the Nigerian Gas Master Plan, the Petroleum Industry Bill, and the Nigerian Content Law. And I'll give a brief overview of these. Perhaps one of the most important policy interventions in recent times has actually been the amnesty initiative of our president. This initiative has disengaged militant youths from criminal activity. Attention is now on reorientation and reintegration within the productive economic activity of the sector. At this time, we are seeing unprecedented peace and calm once again in the region. Significantly reduced attacks on our oil infrastructure and consequently much reduced environmental degradation, increased crude oil production, and less contribution to spikes in the global crude oil prices. Peace and calm, as we have now find, found um, in a very costly manner, is obviously a very necessary prerequisite for any policy implementation. A second intervention, and just as important, is the Petroleum Industry Bill. This proposes major institutional, regulatory, and fiscal changes to the existing legislation governing the industry. And in fact, it brings together over 60 different uh, legislative um, instruments into one holistic uh, instrument. It's going to create much stronger regulatory institutions distinct from policy institutions. Effective regulation will be key to the delivery of all our agenda that I've outlined above including those relating to environmental standards. In addition, it will make changes that will enhance transparency in the oil and gas operations. This is a bill that has been thoroughly debated with well-informed contributions from the United States government agencies, amongst others, and of course various stakeholders within the sector, at home and abroad. And it is now in its final stages or final processes at the National Assembly. We expect that in a few short weeks, it will be promulgated into law. In a related effort, we are reinforcing the capacity and activities of the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency to ensure that as activities of the sector extend into hitherto new echo areas, 
our capacity to respond to environmental spillages is actually enhanced, which is critical. As mentioned earlier, low capacity and high unemployment have contributed significantly to a cycle of attacks on our infrastructure, which have often had major environmental consequences as well. To address the challenge of low capacity, the Nigerian Content Act has also been passed into law very recently. In fact, Mr. President, our president, signed it into law um, in April this year. This provides a legislative framework that ensures increased domiciliation of the industry spend within Nigeria, and this has been a major pro pro problem for us over the years. Uh, so we are very pleased that this uh, is happening now because it will increase local capacity, it will create wealth, and it will enable participation of the stakeholders within the producing regions, not to mention the trickle-down effect around the country as a whole in the core economic activity of the sector. We have already begun to see the benefits of this law within the region, as local capacities for areas such as fabrication, engineering, and welding are increasing significantly, creating a whole range of indigenous job opportunities. And of course, this is also very key uh, to keeping peace and stability in the Niger Delta region. We have also established within this uh, framework the Nigerian Content Board, which drives the aggressive implementation of this law. The board has started a campaign to sensitize local communities as to the opportunities presented to better participate in the sector activity. Let me conclude on the reforms with another very important policy intervention, the Nigerian Gas Master Plan, which is actually inherent uh, within the petroleum industry bill. To reduce Nigeria's footprint in CO2 emissions, we needed a comprehensive framework for gas development and utilization within the country. This formed the premise for the Gas Master Plan. Now, the Master Plan is focused on, firstly, the delivery of a much more viable commercial framework for gas development and supply within Nigeria, promoting gas now as our fuel of choice. Delivery of the most aggressive gas infrastructure network ever prescribed in Nigeria that ensures natural gas availability across a wider region, whilst also enabling increased production of liquefied petroleum gas at key gas processing centers envisioned in the infrastructural blueprint. The repositioning of Nigeria as a regional hub for gas-based industries, such as fertilizer, methanols, petrochemicals, etc., that will provide a proper sink for otherwise flared gas. And of course, the passage of the gas flare out law, which is expected to be promulgated very shortly as well, and that will eventually outlaw the flaring of natural gas in the country. Now, based on these interventions, we are seeing already a significant improvement in both the interest and the willingness of producers to develop natural gas for domestic use. The infrastructural blueprint enables connections of supply to the market, creating a sustainable basis to eliminate gas flaring. We are now transiting from an era of gas flares to one of gas utilization for power and for industrialization. With increased liquefied petroleum gas production from our planned infrastructural drive, the traditional use of kerosene and firewood will be drastically reduced. And along with that, the dire attendant risks to the populace will be drastically reduced as well. Finally, the creation of gas-based industrial hubs obviously stimulates economic growth and employment generation, again, for the many youths in the country, reducing the cycle of attacks on our infrastructure and its resulting environmental consequences. The interventions I have outlined so far position Nigeria to grow our gas supply capacity sustainably from 5 billion cubic feet per day currently to about 15 billion cubic feet per day uh, by the year 2017. With this capacity, Nigeria will be very well positioned to support both domestic demand and major export projects, such as the Brass Liquefied Natural Gas Project, 
The Brass LNG project, when concluded, will supply about 10 million tons per annum of natural gas to major export markets in both Europe and in Asia. In its first phase, it will do that, and a further 10 million tons per annum will be supplied in its second phase. Final investment decisions on this particular project is planned for early uh, 2011, early next year. I am convinced at this time that this multifaceted approach, which deals with gas utilization, economic empowerment of the people, commercial incentives for increased supply, and strengthened regulatory agencies, will enable us to more sustainably eradicate routine gas flaring, reduce oil spills, and significantly drop Nigeria's CO2 emissions annually. And each of the above policy interventions reinforces the other in our consolidated approach to a sustainable contribution to the climatic and environmental world order. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we sit here and discuss energy policy at the global levels, it is essential to note from our experience in Nigeria that this is not a monolithic exercise. On our part, we have come to recognize that supply capacity growth, economic empowerment of the people, climate management, and strict compliance with environmental safeguards are actually all one side of the same coin. Consequently, we have endeavored to address these through mutually complementing policy interventions. Policy thrust necessarily must be multifaceted. Each element on its own is important and needs to be explored in detail. But more importantly, every policy decision and position needs to be evaluated in the context of the various parameters as outlined within my presentation. An attempt to focus on one to the exclusion of the other will create a cycle of inevitable failure or a dire lack of sustainability. I am confident that with the assembly of experts here today, we could not be better positioned to deliberate frankly on these issues. I believe the world watches us, and I most certainly hope that we will do justice to this complex and most critical of assignments. I wish us all a most fruitful deliberation, and I thank you immensely for your attention.